Will SM15 fly for the second time? What happened to the mysterious Nosecon? Can you pay for a satellite with Dogecoin? I'll answer this and many other questions in this episode of Starship Updates. It was a really interesting week, SM15 landed and haven't exploded, Booster B1051 had its 10th flight, and in the meantime Elon dressed up as a warrior for the Saturday Night Live sketch, but let's start from the beginning. We'll start with something obvious to me, but a lot of people wanted me to cover this topic, so I've decided to talk a bit about SM15's landing. In this photo from Twitter user Starship Gazer, by the way, check out his profile for more amazing content, you can see SN15's crushed legs. Someone might say that because they are cramped, the landing wasn't so perfect after all, right? Well, wrong. Starship's landing legs have a lot of holes. Those holes are bigger and bigger the closer you get to the legs base. But why? Well, this mechanism is comparable to a car's crumple zone. In both cases, the objective is to absorb the energy of a sudden stop. In cars, the energy is absorbed to save people's lives, and in Starship, this mechanism protects the whole structure. So yes, the legs were crushed, but that was their purpose. Unfortunately, right now the landing gear is disposable, but who knows how legs will look for the next prototypes. A few hours after SM15's landing, Elon tweeted that they may indeed try to fly for the second time with this prototype. It was kind of a shocking news, but it looks like the data from the sensors and a quick checkup shows that it's in a good enough shape to conduct a second flight attempt. What's even crazier is that SpaceX already took the first steps to get SM15 ready for its next flight. Two days after the landing, SMTP transporters were already placed under the prototype skirt. We were thinking that they'll take it to the high bay, but it looks like even this step isn't necessary and the prototype was transported directly to the suborbital pad B. I guess that it makes sense because almost all needed checkups can be conducted on site without wasting the time on transporting Starship around. Even before placing the SN15 on the pad, the legs were already dismounted, and the prototype will likely receive a brand new, although still one use only, landing gear. The SN15 had to wait a few days before it was placed on suborbital pad B, because the weather made it too dangerous to operate the Tangzilla crane. But as of now, the weather finally got better and the prototype is finally sitting on the pad again. Let's hope that it won't need too many repairs, because I've heard that those micro explosions after the landing might have been COPV tanks, which could have damaged the Raptor engines and that would result in additional delays. Elon's tweet also shows that we probably shouldn't trust the unconfirmed source from the last episode. In this message, presumably from a SpaceX work, it was stated that SN16 should fly in about two weeks, but as of now we don't know when or if SN16 will ever fly. The IR covers still aren't installed, we also don't know if SpaceX wants to take the risk of having two starships on suborbital pads at the same time. Time will tell if SN16s will fly or not, but we have a bit of a mystery regarding this prototype. In this photo taken by Ulmo, you can see something that looks suspiciously like heat tiles on one side of the aft flaps. It sounds exciting at first, but a closer look at the photo taken by RGV Aerial Photography reveals that the heat protection tiles aren't there. I have three theories. A. The aft flaps reflect tiles from other Starship's prototype section. B. The flaps were swapped and the tiles are on the other side. C. It's just an optical illusion. The flap is reflecting the high bay and our brain sees what it wants to see. The first answer is definitely false because if you look at RGB photos from Patreon, which I can't show you, but you can check them out yourself by becoming Mauricio's patron, there aren't any Starship sections with heat tiles near the high bay. Option B sounds interesting, but it's hard for me to believe that SpaceX workers managed to mount the flaps on the wrong side of the prototype, and we also haven't seen an aft flap with mounting points for TPS tiles. So unfortunately, most likely the option C is the right one. In the past, we've seen a lot of starships that at first looked like they've had a ton of tiles to finally be disappointed when it turned out to just be a reflection. I guess that we need to wait a bit more for flaps with heat shield. Before we continue. Have you already considered subscribing to my channel? As you can see, a big portion of you is watching my videos without subscribing, so don't forget to smash this red button. Our goal is to reach 1000 subscribers by the end of this month. You can also leave a like if you found this video useful. Anyway, back to the video. 
Speaking of heat tiles, the SN17 has almost all of its parts ready and it looks like it will have a ton of thermal protection tiles. In fact, the more detailed photo from the building site shows that even though this starship hasn't had any flights or static fire yet, some of its heat tiles from the midlock section already fell off. For me, it looks like at some point they must have been broken and they fallen off when this section was transported. Let's hope that SpaceX's workers will replace them because it must really hurt if you're a perfectionist. While SN15 was being transported to the suborbital part B, the rest of SpaceX workers weren't hanging around and they've transported the mystery test nose constructor to the production facility. It was then moved to the high bay where it was finally freed from its cage. Unfortunately, it probably won't be able to enjoy the freedom for too long as it looks like it will be scrapped. In all seriousness though, it appears as this nose cone has conducted all needed tests and the Max-Q simulator will either be scrapped or a new nose cone will be placed inside for more tortures. Next up, we have the GSE-3 rollout, except that it still hasn't happened yet. The foundations at GSE Farm are ready, the tank itself also looks ready and they've already started building the GSE-4, but for some reason it still wasn't moved to the tank farm. The earliest possible date for a rollout was supposed to be on the 14th of May, but the closure was cancelled. We're also waiting for the GSE shells to be complete. You can see how it may look in the future on this animation created by OEBL. As we know, the GSE tank won't be in much of use when there is no infrastructure to launch the super heavy booster. So let's take a look at the orbital part of Boca Chica. The massive SpaceX's crane called Kong or Redzilla, formerly known as LR11350, is right now being expanded with another segment. On this chart you can see the possible crane configurations. I suppose that to stack the orbital launch tower, SpaceX will need to use the SDW configuration. Next up, it's time to remind you about the high bay bar. It looks like the first glass windows are being mounted on the top of the high bay. According to Elon's tweet, this bar should also have glass floor that will allow you to see the Starship production from the top-down perspective. The best part about this bar is that it will be accessible for the public. I'm just not sure how they'll manage the safety of this thing. The human landing system funding drama continues. As a quick reminder, SpaceX has won the contract that targets 2024 as the year when humans place their foot on a silver globe again. SpaceX was the only chosen company and this made Blue Origin and Dynetics furious as they filed a GAO protest that resulted in the program's suspension. We hope that the GAO will just dismiss the protest and will be good to go, but here comes the plot twist. The USA Senator Maria Cantwell, which convinced conveniently is from the Washington, where Blue Origin's headquarters are placed, sent a proposal for additional funding to be spent on Artemis program. How much additional funding? 10 billion dollars. Where's the catch? Well, NASA would have need to choose the second competitor for the HLS program. Of course, this proposal needs to get through Senate, and as we know, NASA rarely gets additional money. On paper, this idea sounds cool. More money for SpaceX, right? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Two bad things could happen here. The first one is that all of the additional funds could go to Blue Origin to develop their outdated lander, whether with additional funding SpaceX would have been able to get us to the moon in no time. And the second is that this decision could delay the first moon landing, which is supposed to happen in 2024, but this date is getting more unrealistic with every day. But there is also the alternative dimension where SpaceX also gets the additional funding and and maybe let's pretend that this is what will actually happen. Now, let's take a look at the weekly Starship Progress update presented on a nice chart done by Brendan. This time, we'll compare it with a chart from two weeks ago because I haven't shown one in the last episode. SN16 received its aft flaps about which I've talked earlier. SN17 is only missing its flaps and landing legs. SN20 has received the complete lock section. My theory about BN2 slash 2.1 being skipped or becoming a test tank seems to be getting more realistic. And finally, the BN3 received another two tank sections. Now, I have two news not regarding Starship, but they are still connected with SpaceX. The first one is that it appears that the Geometric Energy Corporation was able to pay for another SpaceX mission to the moon. It wouldn't really be that shocking, but the important thing is what currency they've used to pay for this mission. Get ready for it, Dogecoin. Yes, the cryptocurrency that started as a joke is now being used to pay for sending satellites into space. This CubeSat is of course named Doge1 and it will weigh about 40 kilos. It will probably be a secondary payload for the Nova Sea private lunar lander mission, which should launch in the first quarter of 2022. What a weird time to be alive. The second piece of information is that SpaceX was able to achieve something special. During the latest Starlink mission, Booster B-1051 conducted its 10th flight and another successful landing. 
Previously, Elon stated that the goal is to fly the same booster 10 times, but recently during NASA press conference, he said that they fly them until they break. I'm curious to see how many B-1051 flights we'll be able to see. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Starship Updates. Remember, if you've liked this video, then don't forget to click the like button, subscribe and leave your opinion in the comments. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.